How do I look back there? Enough wires hanging down? I had a I had a cardio procedure recently, didn't have this many wires on it. Folks, I am delighted to be back at Forages at KCA. I attended my very first Forages or KCA meeting back in 1975. Dr. Curtis Absher, I was brand new here. He took me to my very first KCA meeting. Now we met that time over at Barron River State Park. The entire Kentucky Cattlemen Convention could have met on these first three rows up here. So to see this organization grow from where it started back then, and that was back with, with Curtis and Smith T. Powell, uh, Russell Cornelius, J.B. Holtzclaw, those core people that had a vision for this, this group and what it has materialized in today really makes me proud. Now, I had a chat with Curtis, had two or three in the last few days. Curtis Absher would have been here today. He's never missed one. But Curtis Absher on Christmas Day had open heart surgery. He had he had uh, three a bypass or three bypasses, three, and then he had a, a valve put in. He got home Saturday, and he's doing extremely well. And so I know he would want me to extend his absolute uh, best to you. So I'm very happy to give uh, that report. Now. We did always did I always came to KCA. We did programs at KCA, and then uh, in the uh, '90s, Curtis and I uh, were doing some forage programs. The meeting in the early '90s was in Louisville. It was at the Ramada End in Louisville. Jack Crowner was the executive director at the time, and he asked me to put together a forage practical forage emphasis program, and it was going to be a half a day session. I did that, I even brought some friends in from the University of Missouri. So we had a great session and it was uh, very well attended. And then the next year, uh, the executive director, Bobby Freeman, and the program chairman of KCA for the following year asked us if we would put together a forage program for that meeting. We said we would. We started that and, and then 20 years we continued to do that. The very last meeting that I put together was a meeting in this particular building, and it was back in 2015. I knew I was retiring the very next month, so I said I want to put together a program that just brings a bunch of my buddies in, and we're going to sit around and talk about some things. So we talked about my top five forage improvement practices, Clayton Gerald's on commercial hay, Bill Payne on dairy, Jason Tower on sheep and goats, Chris Panel from right here in, War in, in Davis County, on beef cattle cow calf and Russell Hackley on stalkers. Now Russell Hackley has always did a fantastic job. Later that evening those of you that were in the banquet saw Russell Hackley for one of the few times in his life on the video screen talking about me and he got emotional. They had to stop and start again. This presentation here was the last presentation that Russell uh, made uh, to a group and I still today there's not a week goes by that I don't miss Russell Hackley. He had that much of an impact. Over the 20 years that we put together programs for this conference, Tall Fescue was the emphasis on a whole lot of programs. In fact, the very last program that we put together that was strictly Tall Fescue occurred back in, in Lexington in 2012. And I talked that day about Tall Fescue the first 80 years. I think I'm blocking some people. Let me move over here. I talked about that, and then we had several other people on the program, uh, including Tim Phillips, who had just started breeding a lot of the novel end of fight varieties at the time. He was having some. He was getting ready to release. And then we had Glenn Aiken with our USDA program, talking about some of the animal performance trials. We had Ray Smith talking about horses. Then we brought Dr. Don Ball from Auburn University in to be our keynote speaker. After that presentation that day, Dr. Ball and I were having dinner uh, uh, a few days later, and he said, you know, that presentation on the first 80 years was very interesting, said, I've worked with Dolph Eskew, said, we should probably put something together on the history. And that started us thinking about the history of Dolph Eskew. Now, we started thinking about it then and then started writing on it a little later. It was the most challenging publication that we've ever written because you can't go to the library and get three years of replicated data on what Mr. Souter did back there in Menifee County. It required me going back to Menifee County, going to the library, talking to county agents, going through old county agents' files, 
and a lot of things, talking to a lot of people. It made me realize that I should have asked more questions to some of those people while they were here that, that now they're gone, I can't ask them those questions anymore. We finally got it all put, put together and got a publisher, and we chose the Moonlight Barbecue as a place to debut that. That's the first time we saw a copy of that, and when you have a full stomach of Moonlight Barbecue, anything looks good, and the publication looked pretty good. Now, I've had a long association with the Oregon Tall Fescue Commission. They're the publisher of that book, and I called in some favors, and that's why today each one of you are getting a copy of that free. Now, if you don't like it, bring it back, and I'll give your money back on it. That's the deal I'll make on you today. And if you want it, if you want to lower the value of that book real quick, just check with me after the program, and I'll be happy to autograph that. Now, today I want to take you a trip through the history of tall fescue, realizing that there's a lot of people in here that know more about tall fescue than I do. I've even tried to get some of them to give this presentation. Dr. Roy Burris, Dr. Gordon Jones, there's a lot of people in here that have tremendous amounts of experience. There's a lot of producers in here that grew some of the very earliest tall fescue seed that was available. And they're free to, to, to talk about things at the end of this. But what I want to do is begin with this man right here. This is Mr. Souter. Mr. Souter was born in Virginia in 1861. He came to Menifee County, Kentucky and bought some small farms, very small hillside farms. He bought three initially. Then the next year he bought another small farm. The second one, the second group that he bought had that hillside behind the picture there in it. On that hillside were a few patches of a green grass that he began to observe. He observed those grasses were in the 1886, 1887, 1888 time frame. And he liked what he saw. The grass greened up early. It stayed green late. The grass, the cattle readily ate it. So he began periodically in the late spring to harvest some seed by hand and just spread it around. So over the next 30 years, he got that complete hillside. He got it seeded down well. And actually, uh, Jimmy Henning found this picture in a county agent's office, and he asked about it, and, and it was tore. Jimmy's done some work on it. And then uh, this is that same hillside taken from a little different angle. And then I want to call your attention to these cedar trees up here because on the back of that picture, it said, this is the farm that the late W.M. Souter, uh, two miles north of Frenchburg, uh, first found that seed up there. And then it was the above cedar trees uh, where it was first found. So we've got that picture. And then the second major important thing that happened occurred in 1931. Dr. Ian Fergus, who was agronomist at the University of Kentucky, he was actually a red clover breeder. If you've grown Kenlan red clover, that was one of his clovers. But he was a very diversified type of agronomist. He was invited to Menifee County to judge a sorghum syrup show. It was November 1931. He went there, judged that show, and then while he was there, two gentlemen approached him, uh, Mr. K.W. Wells and Mr. E.E. E. Lambert. One was the county agent, one was the farmer. They said, Dr. Fergus, what do you think of that grass over on the hillside at Mr. Souter's farm? And Dr. Fergus said, I've never seen it, I'd like to see it. They went over there, and that day in the fall of the year, Dr. Fergus saw cattle that looked good. He saw grass that was green and growing. He saw a very steep hillside that was completely covered with a good sod-forming grass. There was no gullies. There was no erosion, and, and he was impressed. Now, Dr. Fergus was a good taxonomist, and he examined the plant, and he thought it might be some kind of a festuca, a fescue. So he, he took some seed back to Lexington, just a few pounds of seed. He told me he took about two pounds of seed back. And he had a little interest. That winter, he put some in the greenhouse, put some pots out. The next spring, he seeded a little bit there on the experiment station, not too far from where the current football stadium is today. But he seeded that, but he didn't have tremendous. And that wasn't his primary focus, even though he was impressed with the grass. Now, I have never given this gentleman... Well, basically, he had harvested some seed, and at the time Dr. Fergus was there, he had somewhere between 200 and 300 pounds of seed that he had collected and harvested by hand, and he had sold some of that to his neighbors for 15 cents a pound. So that's where the seed supply came from that Dr. Fergus took back. Now, this gentleman right here, 
uh, in the book, we, we talk more about him because in the research, I realized that if it wasn't for Mr. W.C. Johnstone, Kentucky 31 may have been a whole lot later coming on, and I don't know where it would have come on or not. Let me tell you about Mr. Johnstone. Bill Johnstone was an extension agronomist. He was not a forage specialist. He was a grain specialist. He made trips all over Kentucky. He made several trips that he had to go to eastern Kentucky, farther east. When he would come back, he would see that field. He'd drive right through Frenchburg. He'd see it. And it was green early in the spring. It would green up early. It was one of the last ones in the fall to go dormant. And the cattle looked good. He was impressed because a lot, they didn't have a lot to choose from in 1931. So anyway, he would look at that. And one day he finally said, I'm going to stop and talk to find out who owns that field and find out about it. He finally found out that it was Mr. Souter. Then he went and talked to Mr. Souter. Mr. Souter told him that Mr. Fer Dr. Fergus had been there, got some seed, and took it back. Well, Monday morning came, and, and Mr. Johnstone was in Dr. Fergus's office. And he began that day a, a campaign to get Dr. Fergus to work harder on that. He said, we need that grass in Kentucky. The Kentucky farmers need it. We've got a lot of erosion. We have nothing out there now. So it encouraged Dr. Fergus to work harder, and he did. And he worked a, a lot harder on that. He worked until it was finally all the research was done. In 1943, he released that variety as the variety Kentucky 31. Kentucky because it came from Kentucky. 31 because he found it in 1931. That's the plaque at the foot of the hill there you can see today that is there that the local residents of the county and led by the farmers put up as a tribute to Mr. Souter. This is the very first publication written on that. It was written by Dr. E.N. Fergus. When I came on, Dr. Fergus had retired, but he was still actively involved. And Dr. Fergus kind of took me under his wing, and, and, and he was a great mentor to me. And he came out one day and he said, I got a present for you, Gary. He had about a half a box of those publications. He said, this is all that exists. He gave those to me, and I, I was very selfish about what I did with them. I only have one left, but I still have one. In that publication, that first one, that picture's in there. That's the picture of the field that he saw when he went over there in 1931. Good looking, good looking field. Now, this is the picture that I've shown you probably a dozen times over the years. Everybody else has shown this picture. And I decided I wanted to go see that field early in my career, and that I expected it to look like a hybrid between those two fields. When I got over there, this is what the field looked like. However, it has grown up, it's been abandoned, they haven't farmed that, it's been sold several times, but there's still fescue uh, in, in there. You can find a lot of fescue in. Now, it went from that couple pounds of seed that Dr. Fergus took back to Lexington, released in 43, seed was produced, and in Kentucky now, my best estimate is we have about 5.5 million acres of that in the state. We only have 7 million acres devoted to forages. So you see, tall fescue dominates the state of Kentucky. Now, not everybody in Kentucky during that period of time before it was released and after it was released was as excited about tall fescue being released as Mr. Johnstone was. In fact, another agronomist, the forage specialist at the time, was not very happy with it. He, think, he was primarily jealous that Mr. Johnstone was getting all the credit for it. There were some animal scientists that said, we don't think we have enough research data on this grass, so we don't think it should be released just yet, and we certainly don't think it, people should be promoting it like they're doing. So this caused what we've termed the chapter in the book, the Fescue Wars. And I won't go into all the details, but because of this controversy, it got so tense that it went all the way to the dean, it went all the way to the president of the university, even got into Frankfurt. And so something needed to be done, some people lost their jobs. Some people retired early. And after those personalities got out, out of there, then they uh, basically things settled down. But the farmers wanted it. The seedsmen wanted it. And uh, another interesting story that we have a whole chapter on in the book, I don't know of another forage plant 
in the history of Kentucky that a state law was passed related to it. Now, Warren Beeler's in the room, and he knows a lot more about this subject than I do. And there may be another one, but I don't know one. Let me tell you the story. Tall fescue seed production couldn't keep up with the demand of the Kentucky farmers. Not only the Kentucky farmers, but other farmers around wanted to get some of this wonder grass. Well, when the Kentucky legislature were, were approached by this, we need to protect the Kentucky farmers. This was developed here. It's a Kentucky product. We want it to be used by Kentucky farmers. So they passed a law and made it illegal to sell tall fescue seed outside the state of Kentucky. Well, let's go to Huntsville, Alabama. Big farm, the Jones Farm that some of you know down there. It's been a very important historical farm. It was owned by two brothers that had just gotten out of World War II a few years before. They were well-trained Army veterans, heroes. They were both had engineering background, and their families had raised cotton their entire lives. But Carl and Ed Jones had no interest in raising cotton. They wanted to raise cattle. But they wanted something else besides what they had in northern Alabama to feed those cattle. They'd heard about that grass in Kentucky. They made a trip to western Kentucky, to Christian County, to Pembroke, Kentucky. They looked at all those farms there that were growing seed. They talked to the people about that. And they said, we know that it's illegal in the state for us to try to buy seed from you, so we're not asking you to sell it. But would you consider, after you have combined your fields, would you consider letting us bring our combines up here and rethrash it, combine it afterward. He said, well, no, they don't mind at all. They brought a 170-mile trip. They brought four combines, a crew of 10, and a bunch of trucks. And they came up to Pembroke. They rethrashed that seed, and they finally got about 2,000 pounds, and they took that back to Huntsville, Alabama. This is Ray Jones. He's a good friend. He's the one that's actively owning and managing that farm now. He's kneeling in the original field of Kentucky 31 tall fescue that where they brought the seed from Pembroke, Kentucky down there to seed it. Now they went on to establish one of the largest fescue farms in the southeast. It was, they had put in a big seed cleaning plant. It was the number one fescue seed producing company in the U.S. As a result of that they distributed seed throughout the southeast. Now Tall fescue occupies about 35 million acres in the southeast. I have traveled to 57 different countries, and I found tall fescue growing in well over half of those countries. If I'd had enough time to look, I could have found, probably found it somewhere else. This is some of the reasons I think farmers readily accepted and adapted and planted tall fescue, that it's adapted. You look around, it'll grow about anywhere. It's very persistent. That's why it's still in that field down in Huntsville, Alabama. That's why you can still find some of those sprigs on that hillside with dense shade in Menopee County. Some of you have fields that you seeded back that papaw helped seed. It was dependable. It didn't matter where you fertilized it or not, where it got any rain or not, it was going to come back. Fescue was just tough. It would come back. And when you compared it to yield to other cool season grasses, the yields were very good. Fertilize it a little, it'll yield even more. And then quality. If you look at the quality of tall fescue with laboratory analysis, when it's six, seven inches tall, it is very high quality for a cool season perennial grass. However, when animals consumed that during that period of time, some animal problems began. Right after the soil bank days, when you had the old fescue that had been out there for several years, there were some fescue foot problems. And that was serious on the farm if it occurred. And I've been working with fescue all of my life. And I can tell you, in my opinion, when you look at the 35 million acres, fescue foot is not a serious economic threat to our cattle industry right now. But if it happens on your farm, I've seen a few cases. Another syndrome was fat necrosis. And that occurs mostly in those Carolinas, Georgia area, especially associated with farms where they're feeding a lot, of, uh, using a lot of broiler litter uh, on it pastures. So that can be a problem. In Kentucky, at this point, hasn't been, but this is something we're sensitive to watching. 
But this other term here, fescue toxicosis, there's a lot of term for that summer syndrome. And all of that is just poorer animal performance on tall fescue than we know the quality should lead us to be. So why did animals not perform better on this grass that was dependable, yield good, and had decent quality? Well, as research studies started to coming in on that, when animals of any species consumed tall fescue in any form that had that fungus present, what they would oftentimes find is lower feed intake, lower weight gains, lower milk production, and lower reproductive rates. All four of those cost us money. And in the cow-calf business, we were very familiar with that low reproductive performance. And then there were some other things, higher respiration rate, higher body temperatures, rougher hair coat, more time in the shade, excessive salivation. Actually, those animals on that endophyte infected tall fescue are running a temperature. A lot of these activities is just trying to help dissipate that temperature. What was causing all of that was a mystery. Every university just about, and most people working with, with fescue and a lot of, of our vet schools had working theories as to what it was about tall fescue that would not let it have the good animal performance that it was supposed to. And, and really no one could figure it out. And then a major breakthrough occurred. It did not occur in the laboratory. It did not occur on any of our experiment stations. It was another farm visit. This is a farm owned by Mr. A.E. Hayes in Mansfield, Georgia. Now I learned that his grandson was in pre-med at the University of Georgia, or pre-vet at the University of Georgia, and basically he had heard that there was work being done on this, especially in the USDA at the university there, and he told some USDA scientists about his granddad's farm. Now his granddad there in Mansfield, Georgia had all tall fescue on the farm, and he had two groups of cattle. One of the, and he never co-mingled cattle. They stayed separated. One of those groups of cattle showed many of those classic symptoms of tall fescue toxicosis. The other group looked as clean as if they were on orchard grass. And the scientists said, we'd like to see that farm. And so they did. They went out there. Three scientists, Robin's Bacon and Porter went out and they studied everything out there. They looked at the plants, they looked at the animals, they looked at the water, they checked everything they could and found no significant difference between those two pastures and between uh, those animals. And they checked everything. Finally, they, they just didn't know where to go next. And then Dr. Robbins was at the university library one day and he was doing some research, just looking at some literature. And he found some foreign data that says it's possible for fescue plants, festuca, to be infected with a fungus. And he didn't think much about it, but he said, I've done everything else. I think I'm going to go out there and check it. He went out there and checked those plants where the cattle had those symptoms and where the cattle were free. And he found a very remarkable thing. In the pastures where the cattle showed the symptoms, there was a fungus growing in there. In the pastures where the cattle showed no symptoms, there was no fungus. That was the first association of that plant with this endophytic fungus, this endophyte. Now that word endophyte means within, a plant within. So that endo means within, phyte means plant. So this plant, this tall fescue plant, has a fungus that grows inside. Wow. It grows, this, this blue is just the mycelia between the plant cells. It overwinters here at the base of the plant, and that's where it's at right now in your fields. Then when that plant starts to bolt and send up that seed head, that mycelium will grow up through there. It'll concentrate in that seed head and that seed, and if it drops off, if it produces a plant, it will have, a plant will have the fungus present, the endophyte present. So that was the first association, but that's still just a farm association, so a lot of research was yet to be done. We were very interested nationwide in what about the distribution? Is that fungus just isolated on that farm down in Georgia? Or is it everywhere? So surveys started in this state, and some in this audience helped do those. In Alabama was the second pilot program. We did those, and we found out that that tall fescue in the state of Kentucky with five and a half million acres in pre is present in almost all the pastures. Not all. We found some were endophyte-free. Some were very low endophyte. 
And we talk in the book about how that could possibly come about. The second major finding was the fact that those that got out of the sessions, they're standing, come on in, there are seats up front here, the spread of that fungus. Now this was a very important finding and basically summarizing a whole lot of research that the only way that that fungus is spread is by way of seed. If you take an infected seed and plant it and it comes up, it'll give rise to an infected plant. You could grow an infected plant next to a non-infected plant in a greenhouse for eternity. They would never cross. So that was a very important finding. Then several studies were conducted across the country using both pasture, hay, seed, and the conclusion was that for every 10% endified infected, it reduced average daily gain about a tenth of a pound. So if we're running along here with the vast majority of ours infected, you know, we could have, uh, you know, a pound a day gain. If it was 90% infected, we could have nine tenths of a pound uh, loss on that. Also, as far as calving rates, for every 10% infection, it reduced calving rates by 5%. And then also in milk production, a study out of Kentucky, a 30% reduction in milk production when the cows were consuming the endophyte infected fescue versus the endophyte free fescue. Now, my best estimate, if you've got a better estimate than this, I'll be happy to talk, but I believe today that that fungus is costing our industry, not just in Kentucky, but throughout the Southeast, about a billion dollars. If you ever wondered why over my 41 year career, you heard me talking about fescue and the end of fight and renovation and all those things so much because it's getting into your pocketbooks, your billfold, and your checkbook at such a high rate. Also, very familiar with the reproductive performance in marriage. We've known that for years, and there's a whole chapter in there that deals with that. Now, if that's the problem, if it's a matter of there's a fungus in these plants, what's the solution? Very simple. We thought. Just get rid of the fungus, and that was very easy to do. You can get rid of it by storage or by aging the seed, and that's why some of those fields that we sample were endophyte free. They were from old seed. And then also you can treat it with a fungicide. You just basically take that endophyte out, and you've got an endophyte free. And, and, and the general consensus is great. We now have got this problem solved. But then when you put it out in the real world, then you compare that Kentucky 31 with and without a fungus, you realize how important that fungus has been to the adaptability, the persistence, the toughness of old Kentucky 31. So not all endophyte freeze are exactly the same, and Dr. Smith will talk about this later. But when we took the endophyte out, that's what happened. It was not tough. It would not tolerate the abuse that we've been given it in the past. So the second theory was get a good fungus. Find a fungus that will give that plant stress tolerance but will not cause the animal performance problems. So, sounds like a good academic theory. I was in New Zealand in 1989 and I talked to a person about it and he said that's very simple to do. He said you take the fungus out, you get a fungus free, then you get a good endophyte and you put it in there. I said, yeah, but where do you find a good endophyte? And he said, I've got some. Dr. Gary Latch, had, he was an outstanding scientist. He had made trips not only to the U.S., but to other countries. He had selected many, many different types of endophytic fungi. He took me in his lab and showed me gobs of Petri dishes, some with circles around them, some with no circles, which meant that some produced those alkaloids and some didn't. Some produced some alkaloids and some produced others. And, and I thought, well, maybe that's a possibility. And that was in 1989, he began to work on it. Dr. Joe Bowden at the University of Georgia uh, went to New Zealand, did a sabbatic leave, worked with Derek, Dr. Latch. He was a breeder, he had bred a lot of things. He bred alpha graze alfalfa and, and white clovers. He also had several fescues that he had bred, including Jessa. He worked with Dr. Latch, and then in 2000, they had put all that research together, they'd put the endophyte into Dr. Bouton's genetics, and they released that variety after a decade of working with it as the variety Max Q through Pennington C. So for the next decade, that was the only novel endophyte variety on the market. Most of us who had been burned by the endophyte freeze realized that we needed to know two things. One was animal performance. Now the people 
Well, let me show you that. Next to me is Dr. Joe Bouton. Next to him is Dr. Carl Hublin. Dr. Hublin did most of the physiology, most of the grazing work on all of that. Next to, to uh, Dr. Hublin is Dr. Gary Latch from New Zealand and Don Ball. And we were interested in the animal performance and we expected that to be good because we expected it to operate just like an endophyte pre and indeed it did. One of the early studies, gains were about nine tenths or a pound per day difference when the only difference was that endophyte there. Uh, looking at calf production, uh, weaning weights, uh, steer calves were weaning 50 to 60 pounds more, heifer calves 40 to 60 pounds more. And then this was a study that I found interesting that uh, Duckett and others did. We always talked about the discrimination we had of our feeder calves here in Kentucky that came off of these fescue fields and then they went in the feed lot and I always thought that we got all this good compensatory gain. Well, this was a study involving the max Q tall fescue into fight free and then toxic or like Kentucky 31. The red line is the end of fight infected. They went in the feed lot 117 pounds lighter. Now they did make a little more compensatory gain here, but they still, at the end of the 112 days, they came out 108 pounds uh, a lighter. So there was an effect throughout that 112 day feeding period. One of the most classic studies, and I've shown you this before, that I saw came out of the University of Arkansas. They looked at the steer performance on Kentucky 31 and Max Q, and they looked at it in the spring, and they looked at it in the fall. In the spring, a pound per day difference in, in average daily gain, the fall about a half pound. Uh, gains per steer, very significant, 100 pounds more. But now gains per acre, that's what we really sell off the farm. Gains per acre, 461 pounds with the 31, 827. Now, that's significant. That's 366 pounds more beef produced per year on the same acre, same size piece of property without any more fertilizer, any more water, any more chemicals of any kind. And that's a perennial, that's just one year. So that's very significant. This was the question we needed to know. Will it act like that old Kentucky 31 without a, uh, an end of fight? And basically, we didn't want this to happen, so that's what we were nervous about. Dr. Bouton put this in Bermuda grass, which is a most competitive grass warm season that I've worked with. When he did that, found out this is the toxic, it, it, it was the best. Max Q was non-significant right there. I don't think there'll ever be a fest Q as tough as old 31, but these novel endophytes are the closest thing I've seen them in my career. But now look what happens with the fungus free. It's all the way down to a little, almost 20% stand. Now Dr. Tim Phillips and Dr. Uh, Smith's gonna talk more about these in a minute. He's worked and released a variety. There are several varieties on the market now and I'll yield that information to Dr. Smith. Let me answer a few questions before we close up here. Can toxic seed be moved by grazing animals? That's a very important practical question. If we are grazing these fields in the spring of the year when we've got seed heads on there and we've got viable seed, if the animal puts that tongue around and strips that off, which we've all seen them do, that seed can go through, a percentage of that will go through that GI tract and come out viable. Now what we need to keep in mind is a period of time. If you're on an endophyte infected field and you've got a novel or endophyte free field and you don't want to get it contaminated when you take it off of that field during that period of time, and I hope you're not doing that, but if you see anybody from Indiana that might be doing that, remind them of this, okay? You need to have a clean out period there and a two days, a three day clean out period will get all of that out and if you put that seed in some place you don't mind. Another one, can toxic seed be imported in hay? If you went to Illinois and bought some hay that was cut way too late, now you'd never see any of this produced in Kentucky, but they tell me out of states you can get hay that was cut during the seed stage. If you did that and you brought it back, we've all seen this, and unfortunately we have too much of that in Kentucky. That overly mature hay that's got ripe seed in there that's mature can do a good, and it's a good environment. We've eliminated the competition here. It's a good fertile environment, so it's a great place for it to come up in. Yes, we can do that. And this is a very important one. I get this question still today. I'm not going to seed any of that improved fescue because my neighbors have all got old fescue. They never bush hog, and they always let it go to seed. The pollen's going to come over there. Don't worry about that pollen unless it's coming in the way of seed. Uh, that endophyte is not transferred in pollen. 
management strategies, the very first publication I wrote on this, after we knew about the end of fight, I said there's four strategies. One, manage to minimize the effects. We know a lot about grazing. We know a lot about how to keep that thing going. And then diluting the effect. Anything we feed with that potentially can dilute out some of that end of fight. The number one strategy in the state of Kentucky for the last 50 years, long before we knew about that end of fight, was growing red and or white clover with tall fescue. That was our major strategy. We diluted out a lot of that. We'll never totally dilute it. And then we can avoid it. We can avoid it with the most sensitive animals, and that's those reproductive animals, those stalkers, uh, those breeding animals. We also can eliminate it during the most difficult time of the year. That's those hottest months, July and August, and putting those animals off, that's when they're going to get that. And then we can replace it. Now, question that I get, I don't get this in public at all, but after meetings, friends of mine come up and say, well, Gary, should I plan a novel end of fight variety? And I'm retired now, so I don't have to worry as much about being politically correct. And here's my answer to that. If you like fescue, if you like all the characteristics of fescue, and if you're going to feed that fescue to any kind of animal in any form, pasture, hay, or silage, or seed, if you're going to do that, I'd seed a novel end of fight variety tall fescue. Now, if I did, I'd want to make sure. If I paid $3.50 plus for a pound of that, I'm not going to go out here and throw it on top of the ground. I'm going to make sure I do a good job. Keep in mind, these novel endophytes or endophyte freeze, they're still tall fescues. All the requirements that we've always known about establishing fertility, seed soil contact, seeding depth, seeding rate, all of those things are critical for, and, and weed control, very critical. Plus, I have two additional requirements when we're dealing with the novel or endophytes. Number one, if we're going to seed that in late summer of 2019, no fescue plant in that field should go to seed this year. Bush hog, graze, cut it for bailey, something. Don't let that seed go. If it, any seed comes up from, from old seed, older, the endophyte will likely be dead. So make sure it does. This is a very good method developed by Missouri, and it's the quickest I know to get back, and that's go into the old stand in the spring, do a good job of spraying it out, try your best to kill it, spray it in the most killable stage, throw a summer annual in there, Take another good look at it, spray it again here, and then seed the new stand uh, in that late summer. Now the other thing is, when we seed that in, in mid-August and we let it grow, that root system, despite of what it looks like, is still fairly shallow. And we can do a lot of damage by going in there and grazing that uh, too early. I don't like to graze that in the fall. and If I do, just want to top graze it because we can literally do some damage to that. What about silver bullets? We should be able to just put something in the ear, put something in the mineral feeder, give them an injection. We should be able to just annihilate that alkaloid, that end of fight alkaloid. Well, over the years, there's been a lot of things that's come on the market. Now, I think good mineral programs are essential to good cattle production, so I, I'm totally that. But being able to just put a particular ingredient in there is different. Feed additives, implants, dewormers, toxin blockers, some of you have worked with that. There's no question, there's some compounds. If you get it in the animal every single day at the right rate and can afford the cost, it will block those toxins. But it gets to be a management problem. Uh, enzymes, yeast, at, to date. And I know there's claims being made and there's more claims all the time. And I personally do not know of a single thing that will totally eliminate the toxins uh, that would be in the form of a silver bullet. Now, a close with this, and I think I'm just on time. Do you have any questions about anything we've covered up at this point? I, I was going to apologize for going so fast, but that's my normal speed, so I, I didn't want to do that. Any questions? I know there's some people in here that's grown it, and I've covered a lot in a whole lot of a short period of time. So if you got any questions, I'll be happy to address them. Yes. Yes. 
Well, we, we've tried to investigate that some. We think what happened there is basically the same thing that happened here in Kentucky. When we were in the seed production phase here in Kentucky, uh, and I don't know this from personal experience, but the people like Warren Thompson, Dr. Fergus told me, uh, there were a lot of seeds, so people didn't have storage. They stored a lot of it on the ground. And that that they couldn't sell, that they carried over, that was old seed, that's what they used on their old farm. Own farm. Now, we think that may have been what happened uh, there. We think he got the seed one year, and then he, he didn't plant it, and then he got some more seed the next year. So we think one section, and I've got a map of that field from Dr. Robin, but we think that's what happened. That's a theory, John. <laughs> yes. With, with the, the bulls. Yes, there are, there are issues. We don't know nearly as much about the male side of this, but we're learning a whole lot more. And yes, we think the impact when the reproductive area is certainly a factor there. And there's so much going on, on now at research. You know, the genetic work that Missouri is doing on selecting cattle for that. All of those, I think, has promise for the future. And we probably can select on both sides of that. But yes, a good question. One more question, uh, and then we'll uh, move on to the next speaker. Chris. How long, how long is storage for the pesticide? Well, well, we think uh, one, one year, but basically the storage is not going to be the same degree of impact over the 12 months because you got cold temperatures and hot temperatures. Where we found the biggest effect is you're storing it in, in those very hot temperatures. But that's where it is. Now, I would prefer if we had two years. But... Even from an economic standpoint, I know this is not your question, Chris, but I would never try to just age old Kentucky 31 to get me an end of fight free because you're giving up all that production and you can go down and buy it within that. I, that one year, based on Missouri's research, that if you have some, it's going to be a very low, probably low percent. I would not, I would like to have no end of fight infected plants when I go in there and put that end of fight free in. Give Dr. Lacefield a big hand.